You're listening to the Apple Insider Podcast. Welcome to the Apple Insider Podcast, where we talk about all things Mac, Apple, iPad, iPod, iPhone, and more. I'm your host, Victor Marks, and joining me is Mikey Campbell. Hello. Mikey, so tell, tell me about this iPad, the new iPad. What do you want to know? Well, for, first of all, who's it for? Um, well, I think it's pretty clear that it's for uh, first-time tablet buyers or uh, maybe people who want to, you know, just have a not I mean not a cheap tablet but an inexpensive version of the iPad. It's also for education and um, enterprise, I, I think. So. Um, it just basically takes a place of the iPad Air 2 at the bottom of Apple's lineup. So whoever would ha- buy the iPad Air 2 would be interested in the new iPad. And Mike had a hands-on with it mm-hmm. over the uh, the past couple of days. Uh, he, he did some pretty intense going into Geekbench and running specs and getting numbers out of it and things like that. But the, what, what's the summary? I mean, we could go through all the speeds and feeds and the numbers, but... What's what's the summary of it? Do you know? Um. Well, I mean, it's it's an iPad. Uh, it's not the fastest iPad. It's not. Um, I mean, it, it's it's decent. Uh, it's uh, a little better than the old iPad Air two. So it's got a bit bit better processor. But then again, it also has a non laminated display. All the new iPad Pros have a laminated display. So, I mean, it has that, you know, uh, it's closer to the glass. So it's kind of like a screen on glass experience, whereas this one has a little little gap between. Yeah. Now, but but the old iPad 2 was no slouch. It was pretty reasonably fast, right? Yeah, but, the, yeah, um, but I mean, there's been some pretty intensive apps that have come through since the iPad Air 2 uh, launched, what, two years ago? So, um, I mean, it, it'd probably be fine for web browsing and, uh, certain tasks like, uh, spreadsheets, stuff like that. But if you're looking for graphics intensive applications, games and stuff, it might not be the best choice. Mike compared it to an iPhone SE when he and I were talking about it. He, he said the performance was about the same kind of performance you'd get out of the SE, which isn't terrible. I mean, Neil runs on an SE all the time. Yeah. Then again, the SE screen is a lot smaller than the um, than the uh, the chip that it. I mean, than the uh, the six that it was pushing previously, right? The chip inside of it, the A series chip, whereas the nine point seven is retained across um, from the iPad Air two to the new, just iPad. I guess you would call it. Um, and graphics have has always been kind of in issue for iPads uh, is for, for nitpicky people. Like, uh, I think I remember the first iPad Air had uh, some screen tearing issues or a screen wobble. It wouldn't refresh fast enough so it, if you scrolled quickly enough or you had like some um, fast moving games it would, half of the screen would refresh faster than the other half and it would, mm. it would create some a weird kind of tearing issue Um, and you can kind of see that uh, still uh, with the 12.9 inch but it's not as bad but I mean I don't think normal users probably wouldn't notice that as much so I mean altogether it's a decent legacy product I don't know how often they're going to update it Um, they probably might update it as much as they do the SE since it's the considered the low end product on their iPad scale. But we shall see. Yeah. And we also covered iFixit who of course does what iFixit does. They buy the device and then tear it apart. Mm-hmm. And interestingly, it's in construction pretty much the same as the original iPad Air. Yeah. You know, Makes sense. It's Makes kind sense. of what you'd expect in terms of you know not having the laminated screen and in terms of the the thickness of the device and things like that. But what they found that that was interesting to me was that they used the same LCD timing controller from the Air. They used the many of the same parts from the Air to the point where the connectors fit. Even now, now mm-hmm. iFixit didn't 
turn on the iPad and see what happened after they tried that the connector is fitting, but that everything is in the same location and the, the same cables and connectors is pretty interesting, isn't it? Um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of like a parts bin iPad, I guess you say if you, Apple's dipping into their, their parts bin, kind of like automotive companies do. Um, so, I mean, retaining the same manufacturing process saves money. They don't have to, you know, uh, they don't have to start up a new thing and then they, they can also free up space for the iPad pro and iPad pro um the 12.9 inch and the 9.7 inch they keep those lines separate and kind of farm out the rest to the lesser or lower tier suppliers i I would assume that orders for the new ipad are much lower than they are for ipad pro but um we'll see i mean they don't break out apple doesn't break out numbers for that but uh probably got some metrics from market research firms in a few months. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, this whole thing is smells like a, it's a, it's a cost saving device. It's, it's meant to be uh, lean and mean. It's, it's, uh, it's meant to serve a specific uh, demographic, which is mostly education and large installations like enterprise and stuff like that, where they don't, necessarily need to have the latest and greatest hardware but they need something that works and that is inexpensive and to uh to roll out for a master yeah. plan or something like that yeah mm-hmm. and so, the idea that we could get a decent ipad at 329 bucks is uh, a good deal right because ipad ipad minis have cost more than that in the past mm-hmm. yeah yeah ipad minis on its last leg as well so maybe it's a consolation prize for people who, who still want the iPad mini. Well, you, you have to remember is there's tons of people out there who only use the iPad for FaceTime video and, you know, chatting with their grandkids kind of thing. Mm. So it totally makes sense that they would have a large screen that's affordable and being affordable solves sort of the last problem they had to solve with those. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, it comes at the expense of searching new features, I guess. So we'll see what they yeah. do in the future. It, yeah, the, the screen is an interesting one. If you didn't miss the laminated screen, if you never had the laminated screen, you wouldn't miss it. Just as uh, if you never had a retina display, for example, you wouldn't really miss it. Yeah. But uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I thought long and hard about getting this iPad. I was very tempted. I really was. Um, I haven't done it yet, but if one of my kids breaks their iPad, this is absolutely the one I'm grabbing for. Yeah, it's a good one for kids who don't who don't need the uh, the ultimate. Absolutely, you know, I I don't even have the ultimate. It's uh, my my kids are doing better than I am in some cases. So, uh, Samsung is an interesting one. Um, they, they had the apocalypse that we saw last year, of course, with the battery and it, it got to be so bad that, you know, it's, it, if, if they'd bungled it any worse, they wouldn't have survived as a company almost the, yeah. um, you know, my, my wife who pays zero attention to these kinds of things, um, knows and associates Samsung with battery failure and burning up mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, just personally, I had uh, I had moved our family over to T-Mobile as a U.S. carrier because they had some deals about uh, unlimited data, and it turned out to be a very bad decision because, in, in fact, we have almost no service in this area, despite the fact that we have several dealers for it, <laughs> and um, ended up having to switch back after a week. And when we switched back, my uh, my one of my kids needed a handset that was compatible with with the Verizon network. We ended up getting a Samsung device, and my wife freaked out. How could you possibly get a Samsung device? Because won't it catch fire? Mm. And you know the answer yeah, is well, it's a stigma. Well, <laughs> well no, it's this one stigma. won't. <laughs> it's it's not that specific model, but that stigma is is going to be long lasting. Um, now Samsung held a Galaxy S8 event, which did 
you know, did a good for, for Samsung, right? People needed to see that they could come back, that they could announce a device. But they're, they're still hurting because they didn't have the Note 7 and the, the Galaxy 7 devices available for sale until they introduced this S8. The other thing that's interesting is that the introduction of the Galaxy S8 had the coincidence of Apple stock going up. Mm, yeah. I'm not sure if that was a coincidence. I don't know. Well, well I mean, so, so let's know. ask. Is it a coincidence or is it causation? Mm, I don't know. It's really hard to say with Apple stock. Uh, Apple stock is... It fluctuates on so many different variables. So uh, I guess um, theoretically... Uh, people might have seen the S8 and not been too worried that it's going to eat into Apple's share. Because, I mean, really the device is... Uh, it's nothing groundbreaking. It's a lot like the S7 um, the Edge, right? Mm -hmm. It has the, the curved screen. It does. I mean, what, the only difference is that it has a... They integrated the home button into the beneath the screen, which, um, I mean, why? <laughs> so, uh, and and um, I don't know. It, it, it's it, it's a, it's a nice looking device from the front. The back is horrible looking, but um, as as are all galaxies from the back, the camera side. But uh, I think from the front, it looks it's, it's a nice looking device. I still question the utility of having a so-called infinity screen. It doesn't really look like it adds any to the experience. Um, if you swipe from the edge, it's, it's really swiping from the edge. Literally. Yeah, but I mean, Apple does a similar thing. They have, capac they have special capacitive sensors on the left side of the screen that are only on the left side of the screen to facilitate off edge swiping. And th I mean, I'm, I'm talking about the curved, the, the whole semi curved, right, the or, compound you know, curved all the way around. Yeah. I mean, who cares? Why, you know, why would you need that? You know, it doesn't, it doesn't really do. I mean, it kind of offers you that, uh, f uh, artificial perspective of having a screen that goes all the way around. But what's the, what's the point of that? Well, it's, it's following whatever their design ethos is, right? They're trying what to... What is their design ethos? Is to follow Apple? Or to get well, ahead of Apple? I mean, I don't know. I mean, they, I feel like... Okay, but for Samsung, I get it. You know, they want to be... They need to be ahead of Apple. And, you know, I, I saw some uh, articles today saying that with the S8 launch uh, puts Apple behind the design curve. But I don't... I don't... I don't under, I mean, I don't, I, I understand. That. Yeah. I don't, I don't really agree with that. Um, I feel like the, uh, putting them, putting the home button beneath the display was more of a look what we can do kind of thing than a, this is why we did it. It serves a purpose. It doesn't really serve a purpose to hide the button beneath the display with a phone like that. I mean, the, the chin and the forehead are still, they're still there. I mean, they're thin, but they're still there. You could easily squeeze a button on the bottom. Putting a, putting a home button underneath a display, in fact, is it, it's kind of a step backwards because you're going to have to teach users a new muscle memory, or and it, it, in some cases, it could get in the way. You're going to have to have that. You're going to have to solve that problem of. UI interaction completely, you know, in the UI itself. I, it's not going to be I don't think that'll be that big a leap. The, the thing that I'm thinking of is with these compound curves, that is, it, it curves not just on the left and the right side, but it also curves at the top and the bottom of the device and the chins. Y mm. You've created a problem for accessory makers. Mm. You know, the most popular screen protector is a tempered glass screen protector, right? <laughs> and trying to make glass with both of those curves is no small feat, right? It's not easy. I don't know if Apple or Samsung really care about the cottage industry of well, third-party accessory makers. 
Samsung has a program where they, you know, if, if you pay enough money, you can have early access to devices to be able to build your accessories around them. So they have some care about this. Uh, Apple goes back and forth on this, right? A- Apple used to be, they loved accessory makers and wanted them in the stores. Then they kicked out screen protector companies for a while from Apple retail. Then they started making their own cases and then they made their own battery case. So it's, it's a love-hate relationship for Apple. They, they go all over the place on this. But, um, I mean, part of the reason why they did the uh, battery cases because other battery cases were not, quote, up to snuff. And or, Apple's is yeah. with the weird folding thing with the weird pregnant lump on the back. Yeah, but, I mean, what is Apple going to do with their, uh, with their curved display? I mean, they ostensibly have some purpose for it. I, I don't see them slapping a curved display on because... It's kind of the trendy thing to do. They should have some sort of uh, uh, clear benefit to the consumer or to customers for it, as they do with all new hardware releases. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what they come up with. It'll have to be accomplished in software. So, yeah, um, yeah I don't know. I mean, Sa- Samsung had that kind of... A uh, useful uh, thing where if you put your phone, what was it? If you put you, if you put your phone fo- your phone face down, it would light up the sides to show that a call's coming in or something. I don't know who puts their phone face down ever. Oh, but, lots of people. Okay, well, I guess to those people it would uh, make you sense. You know, if, if you're at a restaurant, right? You don't want to be the one person distracted by your phone, so you put it face down on the table. There's there's this some game that people play sometimes, although I've never actually seen it happen. So maybe it's just a, a, a fake internet thing, where people pile their phones up face down on a table, and the first one to grab it out of the stack has to pay for the dinner. Interesting. Never heard of that. No. Nope. Okay. So Samsung S8 S8 Plus, you get the the two size devices. Genius branding, by the way. In the two larger and smaller sizes, right? Just as just as some other company we could name, yeah, has done it. Weird. Regular and Excel, if you will, and uh, you know they they've used Viv, which was the voice assistant, to make an assistant called Bixby. Bixby. Bixby was of course done by the people that did Siri originally. Yeah. Um, and I am kind of excited they, about uh, to see they retail what they can for seven fifty and eight fifty. Yeah, that's it's pretty pricey. Yes, it is. I, I am uh, interested in Bixby though, um, because I was following Viv or whatever Viv Viv for a, yeah. um, for a while, and it did look powerful. If they can get all the, uh, <clears throat> if they can fulfill their promises and get the integrations that they, um, you know, with all the other third party apps and companies and whatnot, it could be a very powerful tool. Well, that's what really uh, matters um, with this voice first stuff, right? If you look at Amazon, for example, a- Amazon not only went after all of the companies they could and got a lot of them on board pretty quickly. The other thing they did, and this was very smart, was that they uploaded code to run on Raspberry Pi to GitHub. So you could go to GitHub, download the code, and run Amazon Alexa on your Raspberry Pi which led to a lot of people experimenting with it, building skills for it, and figuring out how to build their own products that could ship with Alexa built in. You know, if you want to get mass adoption quickly, that's a good example showing how to do it. And now they're not only doing that, they're putting Alexa on Motorola phones, they're putting it on Huawei phones. Um, it's kind of a huge deal because the Alexa assistant will be on more Android phones than the Google Assistant if Google doesn't get their act together. Yeah. I mean, you it's know, Google's great to... taken the position that they're going to be pretty slow and reserved about this, right? Google Home has launched with maybe six different pieces of home automation equipment it could work with. Google Home's Assistant is going to launch on two phones, the Pixel and Pixel XL. Yeah. And they keep saying that they're going to spread it to marshmallow and nougat devices eventually but they've only said some selected ones and they aren't saying which and there's just no telling 
Yeah, as usual. Um, yeah, but I mean, the, the whole voice assistant, neural networks, all that kind of stuff. It's it's um, it's actually happening faster than you know I, I would have thought, which well, is good. We're at the stage with that, like we were with the mouse in 1967. Mm. The, the mouse existed. Doug Engelbart had showed it. Um, he, he gave what's called colloquially the mother of all presentations, demonstrating a mouse. And no one knew what a mouse was for at that time. Yeah. No one had any idea what a mouse was good for at that point. And it took almost a decade and a half to get to having a mouse be useful. So we're at that stage with voice, except it's going to happen faster. Yeah, there's a lot more uh, players in the game at this point. So I've got an iPhone 5 in the family, and we updated to 10.3. And i got to ask, is there anything that I should be concerned about that I should be aware of? Uh, besides the normal slowdowns, I don't, mm. not, not necessarily. Well, the comment so far is that they're not slowdowns, that it's faster. I think it just appears faster because Apple's, uh, kind of clipped some of the animations. So they sped those up like opening and closing an apps and stuff. Mm-hmm. So it feels snappier, but it might not be processing at, at a faster speed. But they pulled the, uh, the over there update after it installed mm. it. Should I be concerned? Uh, I mean, I don't know. We don't know why they did that. Um, they also did it for the fourth generation iPad and, and, uh, and the 5C. Yeah, and the 5C. So all the old 32-bit stuff. Um, they seem to be having like a conflicting... I'm not sure if it's an internal war, <laughs> but uh, they, it seems like Apple is going to drop 32 bit support very, very soon, uh, both for apps uh, and obviously hardware, since 32 bit apps run on 32 bit hardware. So, um, so, does that mean my iPhones are the end of the road? Maybe, maybe, maybe not like in, in the next few weeks, but. Uh, people are th- saying probably by iOS 11 is definitely when you're going to stop seeing updates for 32-bit devices. That could be the demarcation point, the demarcation line. Um, 10.3.2, which was the uh, the latest beta, they don't even they don't even supply uh, 32-bit versions of that yet, and it's already in the the public betas are already out. So. Uh, Unclear whether they're going to release a 32-bit version of it later on. Seems like kind of weird to um, drop support before announcing iOS 11. Um, but then again, maybe they're just kind of softening the blow. Yeah, but they, so they don't you know, have they put to up go this, through uh, it. Notification saying this app will not work with future versions of iOS, right? Mm, yeah. Well, they've been. I mean, they've been saying they've been like warning developers about 32-bit apps for over a year already. So it, it's been a long time coming for that. I mean, ever since the first 64 bit, um, uh, was it a seven, a seven was first, uh, 64 bit processor. Am I right mm-hmm. on that? I think so. I think so. Um, or was it a six? No, I think it was a seven. Um, uh, that just was the beginning of the end for 32 bit. So, um, the time has come. Wow. So how, how's the best way to identify all the 32 bit apps that are on the iPhone? Funny. You should ask. We wrote a story about that. Really? We did. No way. No way. Yep. Yep. Well, so, so take me through it. Help me out. Uh, okay. So basically I don't even read the app, the thing. I just assume it's in a, <laughs> I <laughs> assume wrote a story it's about settings. It, but you didn't read it. Um, no, I didn't. I don't need to. Okay, so let me I don't, read I don't have really anything quickly. for this. But, uh, all yeah. right. So basically, if if you open settings, you tap on general, you tap on about, Aha. and then you tap on, wait for it, applications. Yes. You get a list of applications that are 32-bit. Mm. Well, not just a list of that, right? I assume well, it's... You get, um, it says, app compatibility. These apps may slow down your iPhone and will not work with future versions of iOS if they're not updated. If no update is available, contact the app developer for more information. And it lists the applications that have no apps updates available. 
yeah. those being the ones that are 32-bit. So they don't come out and say these are 32-bit in this dialogue. Yeah. They just tell you they're not really going to be compatible for very much longer, and it's just the list of the ones that are problematic. Yeah, so it's kind of like a notification. or a, Well, it's, it's not kind a of like the alert. So like, it's like one of those... Um, yeah, it's about alert. Remember when they had the... Uh, uh, what was it? escapes me now but they had some sort of alert in settings when you went into settings that would alert you of uh state of a certain app i think it might have been mm. anyway yeah kind of like that well but they've had to yes. make a number of transitions right we had to transition from power pc to intel and for a while they had a thing called rosetta and rosetta translated power pc applications for intel that went away um before that we had the uh the the Mac OS Classic, which ran iOS 9 within OS 10. Rather ran System 9 within OS 10. Sorry, the names get confusing after a while. And so we, we've had these different translation layers over time. And they all eventually expire as we migrate towards whatever the great future is going to be. So this is not a huge surprise, but it is kind of frustrating because, well, that iPhone 5 is working great right now. Mm hmm. Especially since they brought back the SE or that format with SE. Yeah. Mm. Of course, not the, uh, the chip. The chip is. No, the chip is much, entirely much new. Faster. But, but yeah. you know, I just dropped a fresh battery into the iPhone 5. It's trucking along great. There's no real reason that I should get rid of it mm. at this time. It's, it's a good phone. So. Well, I mean, you could always just run whatever the. You could stick with iOS 10.3 since you got it. And stick not do app updates. Yeah. I mean, similar to people who... The hipsters who still have the uh, original iPhone that they're using. I, I have one of those around here somewhere. But the, the issue then is this is going to be a problem for people who have apps that are no longer updated. Uh, a good example of that is FileMaker's Bento. Mm. Bento was an application that allowed you to make databases in a super easy way and have them between Mac and iOS. Now, it first debuted, wow, back in Macworld 2006 or 2007, and it was really popular for a long while, um, but FileMaker killed it off. They don't do it anymore, and it's going to stop working when this apocalypse comes. Yep. Yeah, That's going to happen. It's not good. Growing pains. Well, you know, it's horrible for that person who uses that app, right? It, no, everyone else is going to say, you know what, big deal. But that one, that that one person is, is the going to suffer. You know, if you lose 100 <laughs> apps, right, it's going to be a problem. If you lose the three that are critical for you, it's a problem. And this is the same kind of thing Microsoft butts up against every time they change Windows. You know, they've had to do XP compatibility layers and Windows 7 compatibility layers, and they, they have to deal with this backwards compatibility where traditionally a Apple has forged ahead. Um, but what I'm wondering is how many 32-bit apps that are not going to be updated are in the App Store? How much of a bloodbath is this for clearing house out of the App Store? That's a good question. Um, I don't know. Do you think it's on developers to... Uh update their own apps or do you think that uh, Apple should institute some sort of porting I think it's procedure? on developers to do it and I, I think it is for this reason you want to use software from developers that remain engaged that remain committed to keeping their apps alive if you're using something that's old and it gets dragged along through compatibility letters it's going to stop working at some point because something else is going to break it. Um, doing this stands a chance of spurring developers to go ahead and revisit and update the thing that they haven't touched in a long time or kick it out of the store. And yes, that's a problem for people who rely on that thing, but the, the opposite is, is bad too. So you get to pick between two bad experiences, decide which one is going to be the one that's more beneficial over a broader context. Now, should developers be charging for the 64-bit compatibility, or should they do it out of the kindness of their own heart? Geez, that's a tough question, and it's a tough question because 
Apple doesn't really expose other than by saying it might not work if it's updated. Um, you know, there, there's no talk about 32-bit or 64-bit and what's involved. And so, you know, common users aren't well, going from, to feel the, the sympathy or understanding that, that there's work involved to update it. Right. Well, I mean, uh, Apple's language has changed from it might slow down your app to flat out, this app will not work with the next update yeah. in the latest beta. So seems like they're going to break compatibility completely, which means you know users who aren't who who haven't let's say a user hasn't opened a 32 bit app in a long time and then they go back to use it one you know someday in the future after upgrading to iOS 10.3.2 or 11 or something yeah. and come to find out it's not working you know so uh, here, here's gonna the cause thing. Some fuss here's it, it's going to cost them a little fuss but this is something that Apple's able to do because the App Store is the behemoth that it is right mm. if if the app store were a lot smaller if developers were a lot less motivated to update their apps in general the store would would become a wasteland after this kind of move right right this is what happened to microsoft with windows phone uh you you may remember this right they initially the microsoft store on windows phone didn't have uh, age flags the way that Apple's App Store says warning you know this was this app's only really good for children over people over seventeen, right? Yeah. So Microsoft, in their infinite wisdom, told developers that they had to flag their app with the proper age ranking, right? Yeah. And that they couldn't just do it by editing tags, which would have been the sensible thing to do that instead Microsoft asked everyone to submit a new build. Yeah, that seems uh, a bit onerous for a it, it was quick change. It, for, for a third place app store, it was entirely too onerous. Many developers said no thank you, and Microsoft purged every app that didn't have the new updated build with the proper age flags on it, even if nothing else changed. They just wanted a new build so they could do that. And um, they emptied out their app store, essentially. Not entirely, Genius. but they, they threw out a lot. And where is Windows Phone now? Dead. Did you see that um, they're going to have a Windows... Wait, what was it? Not a Windows Phone version of the S8. There's like a Microsoft... Microsoft... So S8 has story. a thing called Microsoft. a Dex. Yeah. And the, the S8 DeX is a little dock that you can connect a keyboard, mouse, and screen to and use your Android as if it's a computer, which is awfully similar to the Microsoft dock that you could use with a Windows phone back in the day. There's going to be a special Microsoft Galaxy S8 that will be sold through the Microsoft retail stores because there is no Windows phone. Yep. You're making a lot of mic noise over there, Mikey. Oh, am I? Oh, yeah. Bouncing that thing around. So let's talk Apple Pay for a moment. So mm. do you use Apple Pay on your little island paradise? It's becoming a bit uh, more prevalent. Still not everywhere. Or still not in most places, I'd say. But it's, uh, it's in a couple more places than it was before so it's 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 getting slowly slowly getting there cool i uh, i like my apple pay a lot i'm very pleased when i get to use it it just uh, works faster than chip and pin or chip and signature it's uh it's reassuring knowing that apple generates a secure number that's different than my regular credit card number so i don't have to worry about it being stolen um, i'm very happy with that so I've been watching the Australia thing that's going on. Mm. And the Australia thing is where the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission is talking with the banks because the banks are really unhappy that they can't just negotiate with Apple over access to the NFC in the phone and route around being a part of Apple's wallet. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, they're upset that they can't continue they, cornering the uh, market. Right. The, they they want access to the NFC chips. So they can do their own thing. Yeah, it's funny how they're targeting only Apple. Well, it's not really funny that they're targeting only Apple because the Android handsets allow access to the NFC chip. Mm, yeah, I guess so. You can do your own payment over NFC with Android without a whole lot of worry. You can't do it do because they get Apple access, locks it down. Do they get access to the... Um, isn't it on a manufacturer basis, though, with Android? Not exactly. Um, because I, I thought that was my understanding that it was, depending on the manufacturer, you could get hardware-level access to the uh, NFC chip, but only if it goes through a certain... Uh, security layer, if, depending on, and that depends on the manufacturer, like mm, say Samsung. Not, not certain. My understanding was different. My understanding was that if the hardware is there, you could talk to it the same way you can talk to the camera or anything else. Hmm. Interesting. Well, well, in any case, there are a number of there are a number of applications that talk to NFC for things that aren't payment related, right? There are the yeah. ones that exchange address book information. There are the ones that that uh, do it for pairing Bluetooth. There, there are all these different functions and features you can use it for. Mm. And Android Pay is Google's NFC payment wallet. But you can route around that and make your own in mm. Android is my understanding. Yeah, that makes sense. The banks can do whatever they want on Android, but if they want to touch iPhone, they have to go through Apple Pay and be a part of the wallet. And they don't want to do it. Mm, of course not. Because it would... Um, seed not only control of their app but their money flow or their ability to skip out on um, card processing mm -hmm. payments or fees yeah but of course they're framing it as customer choice so they're framing it about um, being consumer choice yeah that and uh they're worried that apple is going to stifle innovation in the payment sector well, as they say it, Apple has stated a desire to own the entire mobile wallet and will use this beachhead into mobile wallets afforded them to them by complete control over mobile payments on iPhone to exert control over the rest of the digital wallet. Mm -hmm. that's of me. course, that's only for iPhones. Yeah. So as far as I know, there's other phones available in Australia. Oh, my goodness. I can't believe it. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Well, anyway, they see... see, see uh, Denied their request. Yeah. Finally, after doing a uh, draft denial or draft determination denial, now it's a final, final denial. So mm -hmm. they don't get to do that anymore, or they don't have the option of negotiating. Well, so they can still decline to to sign on mm -hmm. to Apple Pay, right. but but they can't insist and use the strength of government to force Apple to negotiate about it. Right. Well, their plan was to embargo uh, or to boycott Apple Pay altogether, um, which they can no longer legally do as a collective group of banks. So, well, they were going to do that in order to negotiate. They were going to do that mm, to force Apple to negotiate. They can't force Apple to negotiate now. Yeah, so they can't. They cannot boycott Apple Pay. I don't know. It was kind of like a weird, it like doesn't, regulate, no, regulatory no, no, thing. No, no, It's they. They are not. They're. They're. They can boycott Apple Pay all they want. They don't have to sign on to it. Just as no bank has to mm. sign on to it. No, they can't officially boycott Apple Pay. It's that was part of their proposal. They, they were requested, asking. They they, they requested, requested approval to negotiate together. No, they, the installation they, they requested, of non-Apple Pay software on iPhone hardware. Okay. They requested a, a boycott as well. They've been told that they cannot collectively negotiate for that. Mm. They can decline to install it. They can decline to get on board with it. They can decline to accept it, just as any bank can decline to accept Apple Pay. They're not going to be forced to suddenly start doing Apple Pay. They just no, can't, can't force Apple dude, to get on board with it. I wrote all of these Australian ACCC stories, and they were asking to collectively bargain for that, first of all. First, okay. they first came out saying we're going to collectively bargain, or we want to um, negotiate mm -hmm. uh, Apple Pay with them. Then they said we want to neg negotiate access to Apple's NFC hardware. Right. Um, and during that time, they said they're going to collectively bargain with and boycott Apple Pay. 
as part of their uh, formal legal brief to the ACCC. I'm not sure how the um, Australian regulations are or uh, as far as boycotting, officially boycotting a product are in Australia, but it seems that they had to go through the um, consumer group or bureau to uh, institute that boycott. So they were um, they were requesting authority to collectively boycott Apple Pay, which the ACCC shot down. So they can't do it anymore. It doesn't mean that they have to accept the terms and, you know, they're not going to be forced to create apps, of course, for Apple Pay, because, I mean, that would be like saying you have to make something for... Well, there are no apps yeah, you, for you, Apple Pay. Yeah, or you'd have to... Uh, they, they were... You, well, not, not an app, they, uh, or an app that... Uh, to, to, to provision their cards for Apple Pay. They're not going to be forced to um, do that or to force to make their cards support Apple Pay, whatever their cards are. I'm not sure. I think most of their cards are MasterCard and I think Visa. I'm not really sure. But yeah, so they're not going to be forced to do that. But they, at the same time, they cannot collectively, the four banks, or I think it was three banks and then they added on another bank or two smaller banks actually. So I think did technically you, it's five banks. Did you read banks. the actual determination? Yeah. Okay. Did you? Yes. First paragraph. The banks uh, to collectively bargain with Apple and collectively boycott Apple Pay. Cannot do that. Mm, that's what determination you're reading. That's not the determination here. The Australian Competition Consumer Commission has issued a determination denying authorization. No, to no, the that's the Australia. press release. That's not the determination. That's a press release. Yeah, that's the Read press the actual release. Determination. I also have, I have the determination. I also have the bank's statement. They cannot boycott Apple Pay. That does not mean that they are forced to accept Apple Pay. It just means that they cannot collectively use boycotting as a threat to. They they can't force the negotiation. Yeah, basically, they they can't what use boycotting to push. Yeah, <laughs> so they can't boycott it. Right, they can they can decline. Individually, they can decline to get on board with it. Uh -huh. Yeah, individually, uh, collectively, they cannot boycott. I don't know what they're going to do individually. We shall see. A and Z, who does um, accept Apple Pay, uh, supposedly saw a spike in signups or for new accounts and stuff. When they started to accept Apple Pay around, I think it was before these three banks decided to lodge their protest. Um, so I don't know, it, it could be in their best interest to make an, uh, to make their financial assets available and partner with Apple, but I don't know. It seems like this is their last stand and they, not that the ACCC said, mm, sorry. Can't do that. So where else is Apple Pay making inroads? Uh, they just launched in Taiwan, uh, and uh, we covered that. Um, and actually, they launched with uh, quite a bit of support. I think it was uh, eight banks in, altogether, wow. which is fairly large. For, uh, quite a lot yeah. for a small island. Yeah. Especially, yeah, especially for a small, small place like Taiwan. Um, and there's, there's rumors they're going to launch in Italy. There's been like over the past day or maybe a day and a half, there's been uh, some rumblings on Twitter that banks are, or that users have seen uh, their cards um, being able to be provisioned on, on Apple Pay since uh, the release of 10.3. Uh, but there hasn't been any official statement yet, and Apple's webpage still shows it as coming soon. So I think they're just getting things ready um, for an official launch, maybe maybe this week, maybe next week. We'll see. Could be that they wanted to launch both Taiwan and Italy at the same time, since they're not you know huge major markets. Um, they've done that before. So we shall see. It should be coming. One of the so things cards about are, go ahead. No, no. I was just thinking about you know what what's involved in getting a bank ready for this kind of thing, and but mm. there, there's the retailer end which has to have all mm. the hardware rolled out to their point of sale, but there's also the banking end which has to 
uh, get all of the cards in and approved. Yeah, right. And, you know, you've had other NFC-capable hardware, mm-hmm. like the uh, the coin mm-hmm. card, you remember. Yeah, right. But you have to have a bank that's on board with that. For for each new product that uses NFC, you have to have the bank approve that specific product. So there are a ton of these these products out there, like Coin, like the Swatch Bellamy watch that has NFC in it, that are never going to get approved by most banks. Yeah, it's a huge undertaking. Um, but Apple seems to be knocking them out pretty quickly. Although we don't know how long they've been actually negotiating with banks could probably for many many months just anecdotally my experience is that they're doing better than android is because uh, i have i have cards that will not approve an android pay but for the same bank will work in apple pay Hmm. yeah it's kind of weird um i don't know how it is with internationally i mean i i feel like internationally like the large international banks kind of roll out apple pay and android pay at the same time whereas uh regional u.s banks kind of pick one first kind of see how that goes and then then they offer the next one i guess since they don't have the maybe they might not have the capacity to do monitor both Hmm. i I really don't know if it's capacity or um some department's preference it's it's really un or, or simply that google hasn't reached out to them all yet yeah could be well we'll see i mean it the italy thing could be just like a mastercard you know one of the one of those mastercard partnerships where it's not a specific bank per se it's uh general mastercard support mm-hmm. um but it seems like uh, it seems like there are specific banks that are whose cards are being accept are now being accepted for provisioning. Although there isn't a comprehensive list yet, and the um, <clears throat> availability is kind of spotty, it's kind of hit or miss. So it seems to be like they're kind of switching on the back end slowly in Not preparation of a larger yeah. launch. Yeah. So Italy seems like it's next. Then. Uh, uh, Germany would be the next big one. Excellent. That should be a that should be Germany's going to be an interesting one. one anyway because I don't really use cards over there so much. Yeah, so it it should be a. That's one of the things that I think Dan told me when he'd gone was that it's uh, it's very much a cash based kind of thing. Yeah, they do like their cash there. It's kind of the same thing with Japan, though. Japan is very much a cash based country, although they slowly moving over to credit credit cards are really expensive there to Mm. have a credit card um uh but usually stuff goes directly to the bank so apple pay kind of solves that problem if you don't need a credit card right you haven't Mm. you connect it directly with the bank you can maybe take it out directly out of your checking or whatever debit so it kind of solves a problem for them kind of like a stand-in for credit cards interesting but um yeah, but I, I don't know. Apple Pay does solve a lot of problems, and I wish more people here supported it. It'd be great. Excellent. Here, here. Well, this is the Apple Insider Podcast. Where can people find you on the internet, Mikey? Uh, at Apple Insider or at Mikey Campbell 81 at uh, the Twitter machine. Brilliant. And we'll look for more articles coming from you uh, this coming week. I'm yes, your host, Victor Marks. Yeah. This is the Apple Insider Podcast, and if Mikey surrounds himself with 24 of the new iPad to make this giant multiple display kind of thing and run music videos on it, we'll tell you all about it in the next Apple Insider Podcast.